All right, so we are now live. We'll have our uh, we'll have our introduction um, by Madam President Ladera Lee. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Out of concern, desire, and the desire to change the legal landscape of Alabama, Miles Law School was founded, admitting its first class in August of 1974. The law school's motto, motto of striving to balance directly relates to the imbalance, disparity, and disproportionality of Black lawyers and of the underdeserved minority population that exists in this state. Since the first graduates in 1978, the law school's sons and daughters have made tremendous strides in closing the gap. The mission of the Black Law Student Association is to increase the number of culturally responsible Black and minority attorneys who excel academically, succeed professionally, and positively impact the community. In alignment with the organization's mission and vision, the Miles Law School chapter of the Black Law Student Association continues to articulate and promote the educational, professional, political, and social needs and goals of Black law students. Thank you, Madam President. The speaker of the hour today, uh, we have attorney Robert Jenkins. Attorney Jenkins actively handles a variety of white collar crimes in both state and federal courts. He is a graduate of the National Law Center at the George Washington University. Over the last 25 years, Mr. Jenkins has successfully defended individuals accused of embezzlement, wire fraud, bank fraud, bankruptcy fraud, conspiracy, theft of government property, aggravated identity theft, and tax related violations. He's tried more than 100 jury trials. In addition, Mr. Jenkins litigates matters on direct appeal as well as related post conviction matters. He is a member of the Virginia State Bar and has been admitted to practice before the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, United States District Court for the District of Colorado, Eastern Division of Virginia, Western District of Virginia, and District of Columbia. He has also been granted special permission to appear in matters before the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York Eastern District of New York, District of West Virginia, and the District of Maryland. In 1998, Mr. Jenkins was introduced to the George Mason's Inns of Courts as a barrister in recognition of his accomplishments in the legal field. In 2017, the American Institute of Criminal Law Attorneys honored him with an award for client satisfaction. In 2020, Mr. Jenkins was named to the top 10 list of criminal defense attorneys in Northern Virginia by Attorney and Practice Magazine. He also holds professional memberships in the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers and the National Trial Lawyers, Lawyers Top 100 Trial Lawyers. Mr. Jenkins has appeared as a legal commentator on local and national television. He has been featured on the reality series, American Greed. Mr. Jenkins has been quoted in both the Washington Post and Washington Times. He also routinely lectures as a, as a Virginia continuing legal education speaker on federal criminal defense issues. He is a life member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Sigma Tau Delta Legal Fraternity, Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity, and last but certainly not least, the best fraternity known to man and woman, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Mr. Jenkins, I've had the pleasure of hearing Mr. Jenkins speak and in, in, I've had the pleasure of hearing Mr. Jenkins speak before and he is a phenomenal and dynamic speaker. I, we, are, we are ready 
to hear what you have to say, Brother Jenkins, and I turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, uh, particularly highlighting our uh, fraternity in common, Cap Alpha Psi. Um, it certainly is a pleasure to come before you today and take some time and talk about a subject that's very dear to my heart. Um, when I was a law student, um, now almost 30 years ago, um, I had a dream, I had a vision, a goal, and that was to one day own my own practice. Um, and when I was in your position, I was like a sponge trying to absorb information from every source, every knowledge source there was that was available to me. And I could just think back to what it would have been like if I had an opportunity like this to sit with someone who had actually walked the walk and traveled the path that I wanted to go down to. So it certainly is a great opportunity for you, but as well as for me to give back, um, to help those who are coming behind me to achieve all their goals and to aspire to be all that they can. Um, as I indicated, <clears throat> Starting my law practice wasn't um, necessarily a unique thing. There are many African-American attorneys out there um, before me and since me who have done the same. Um, many people, when they hear my story, what they're really struck by is the fact that I did it um, immediately upon graduation and successfully passing the bar. Um, there was no period of time in which I was um, an associate at a law firm um, learning how to practice law, I did it right out the box. Uh, and many times when people hear that, uh, beyond applauding um, the gumption um, that it took to get it going, um, I immediately started getting bombarded by questions of, but how did you do it? Um, how did you go from a zero client base uh, to starting your own law practice and being able to make it successful? Um, so when I got the invitation from Brother Stubbs, I certainly uh, immediately accepted uh, and look forward to spending some time with you and certainly encourage each and every one of you to ask questions. Um, this is your opportunity, and I certainly enjoy that type of exchange. Um, but to at least get us started, if I could just share my screen, I have put together just a brief outline of some things that I think is important um, for anyone who may be considering doing the same uh, to take into consideration. And by no means is this a all-inclusive comprehensive list of everything that you would need to know, uh, but at the same time, I think it highlights some of the most important factors that you should consider if, if this is something that you want to do yourself. I trust everyone can see my screen. Is it visible? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. Mine just blanked out. Let me see if I can go back, start again. Here we go. Well, one of the first things that I think that you have to consider is whether or not you have what I consider to be certain intangibles um, that are key to being successful. Uh, looks like we went out again. I can still see it on my end. Okay. It went out on mine. There you go. The intangibles. If you're going to be successful with um, any business endeavor, particularly um, running a law practice, you have to be self-motivated. And what I mean by that is that, you know, some people are only able to accomplish tasks and get things done when someone else is pushing them and someone else is providing the necessary motivation. Um, if you're going to practice, start with your own law firm, it's going to be about you, it's going to start with you, and it's going to end with you. Um, so it's key that you are that type of individual that is self-motivated. Um, certainly a compliment to that is that you must be a driven, a highly driven individual. Um, you know, <clears throat> there are some people, again, who only seem to be driven when someone else is pushing them. Um, but again, to be successful in starting your own business, regardless of what it may be, but particularly when you're talking about the practice of law, 
um, you need to be self-motivated. And that's something that is very, very, very important um, in order for you to be successful. Uh, again, I'm having some problems with being able to see the screen. Let me just try this one more time. See if I can pull it up again. Okay, and you certainly have to be the type of individual that works well independently. Again, you won't be in the beginning in a traditional firm type setting. Um, we have fellow associates you can lean on um, for advice and counsel um, to include also being able to, you know, pick the brains of partners and get that type of guidance that a firm environment often will provide to a new lawyer. Um, if you're going to, again, be starting your own practice, um, you have to make a self-assessment whether or not you're the type of individual um, that can work well independently uh, without that type of infrastructure of support around you. Um, there will be support, and I'll speak about that a little bit later on that you can draw upon. However, you won't necessarily have the benefit of that um, firm structure to rely on. Again, for some reason, I can't keep my screen going. Next, it's very important that you develop a game plan. Um, you know, much of success in anything in life really depends on whether or not you have a plan, um, a well thought out plan and running a law practice is no different. Um, you need to make a determination as to what are going to be your areas of practice, um, where your practice is going to be located. Um, certainly you need to develop a business plan to include a budget, a marketing strategy, and that's certainly something that I'll speak on in a little bit greater detail later on in the hour. Um, you need to develop your market niche. Um, how do you fit in what your hourly rate is going to be? Um, there are ways to determine uh, an appropriate hourly rate for any lawyer given their experience uh, coupled with their operating expenses. Um, in order to be successful, when you first enter the market, um, you're gonna need to set yourself apart. Um, some of the things that you can do in order to do that is to ensure that you have flexible hours um, that you're willing to meet with clients in alternative arrangements. Most law firms um, have highly structured hours between nine to five, and meetings often only occur at the law firm. Uh, but if you're going to be new to the, um, to the practice of law and running your own practice, you're going to need to uh, be a little bit more flexible when it comes to that. Um, mentorships and joining voluntary bar associations. When I first started out my practice, um, this was certainly a key to my success. Um, you need to familiarize yourself with your local bar. Um, if you can identify one or more mentors, those who have more years of practice, a little bit more seasoned, uh, who can help guide your steps uh, and show you the ropes, so to speak. And one of the best ways you can do that is to join your local voluntary bar associations. Um, all states have a, a mandatory bar um, that once you uh, successfully pass the bar and meet all the fitness requirements and you're admitted that you're required to maintain an active membership in. Um, but every state, every local jurisdiction also has voluntary bar associations. Um, many of them might be based on gender, um, when women bar associations, uh, ethnic groups, uh, you know, Hispanic bar association, African American bar associations, those are great resources uh, for you to develop mentorships. Um, those who've been around again, who can help show you the ropes. Now, one of the biggest areas that um, new lawyers or people trying to start a law practice will often, you know, wonder about is where do you get clients? 
Um, what, how, how do you start to recruit clients? Um, some of this will be dependent on your chosen area of practice. Um, I always had a desire and intent to get into criminal defense. Um, so for me, uh, the Criminal Justice Act, uh, which is a federal statute that pretty much dictates um, that any person who is indigent without sufficient funds to hire an attorney, um, the court is obligated to appoint counsel for that uh, indigent individual. Um, now, in most jurisdictions, that will be covered by the public defender's office. Um, however, the public defender's office, uh, due to sheer volume, is not able to represent everyone who might qualify for court-appointed assistance. Uh, and also because of rules governing conflict of interest, um, there's a need to have um, private attorneys who are available for appointment by the court to assist indigent um, individuals. So that's certainly is something that I encourage you to look into if you have criminal defense as one of your practice areas. Um, also, most state bars have referral services where members of the public can contact the Bar Association looking for an attorney. Um, and the Bar Association generally has a referral system where they recommend attorneys in those individual areas that could be of assistance to those private citizens. Um, there are also commercial referral systems out there. Uh, many of them are web-based um, that you can look into that will help um, market or lead uh, or point potential clients in your direction. Um, and you also should explore your local trade unions um, because oftentimes they're in need of affordable counsel and you may be in a position to assist them. The key to any business or any law firm success is always going to come down to marketing and how well you get your name out in your local community. Now, one of the advantages that has developed since I started my practice is the advent of the internet. I'm going to date myself a little bit, um, but when I first started, um, there wasn't an internet, at least not as we know it today. Uh, there were no web pages, emails, and things of that type that you could exploit in order to market your practice. But now those things are all available. Um, when I started, there were just the yellow pages. And you took an ad out in the yellow pages. Uh, many, probably many of you don't even know what that is. Uh, had no experience with actually having to go to a, a, a book to look up business phone numbers and things of that nature. But now you have the internet, which is certainly exploit it to its fullest uh, ability. Um, you have to have a good professional web page, or you can do direct email marketing and things of those nature. And certainly you should exploit, exploit and leverage your professional and social affiliation. Your church, uh, your fraternity, your sorority, your undergraduate alumni associations, being actively engaged in all of those things can be a great source of potential clients. But when it all comes down to it, nothing is going to be a substitute for hard work. Um, you have to understand that in order to run a law practice, there are going to be long hours. Uh, oftentimes, you're going to be called upon to work seven days a week. Um, that's not uncommon uh, in the practice of law. So that I wanted to start off with, just to give you an overview of some of my thoughts of things that you're going to need to consider if you want to embark upon starting your own practice, particularly right out of law school. So with that being said, um, I wanna open it up for questions um, and let's see if we can have a lively exchange. Who would like to go first? Well, I, I, have, a, I, I have a question. Okay. Um, what uh, what are you, what are some tips that you have, um, or do you have any networking tips as it relates to, you know, navigating those navigating those waters with every, you know, and I, and I hate to say it like this, but I've you know I've heard attorneys say that attorneys come a dime a dozen <laughs> nowadays. So how how do you set yourself apart from everyone else who's you know, who's already been out there and you're new out the gate, how do you set yourself apart from those individuals? 
Well, you know, there's, there's multiple ways you can do that. Um, and first and foremost, when you're new, you have to recognize that you don't have the experience um, you don't have that as one of your advantage. And therefore you have to acknowledge that and you have to price yourself, so to speak, in the marketplace accordingly. Um, so if the, um, whatever the average hourly rate or compensation rate is for an attorney in your area, um, you need to scale that back uh, to comport with your experience to make yourself a little bit more attractive to um, potential clients in your area. Um, but you've got to start with leveraging your own network, um, your friends, your family, your social group, um, your peers. Um, everyone who knows you should know that you are an attorney um, and that you are available for hire. Everyone in your church should know that. Everyone in your fraternity, in your sorority should know that. Um, you should look. Now's the time for you to be fully engaged with voluntary um, charitable organizations. Volunteer your time. Um, board of directors for local civil organizations are always looking for young, talented legal minds. Um, at this point in time, one of your greatest commodities is time. You have it. Um, you should volunteer that time. You'll make connections. Um, it may be slow in the beginning, uh, but it will build up. Um, so those are just some of the things you can do right out the gate um, in getting involved and getting engaged. When you first start off um, your practice, many bars, I know in Virginia, we have mandatory continuing legal education courses that we have to take X number of hours. I think we're up to like 15 hours per year. Um, you should exceed that. Um, not just because it's a great educational opportunity, but that is a significant networking opportunity. Everyone who attends those mandatory uh, continuing le legal education courses, they're lawyers. Um, most times they're gonna be lawyers with greater experience than you. Um, and it gives you an opportunity to interact with them. Let them know that you're out and you're available. And one of the things that those of us who've been practicing for um, a number of years will do is we receive phone calls from potential clients all the time who may want to um, hire, engage our services, but they just can't necessarily meet our hourly rate. Um, they're not in a position to pay what the going rate is for our time, but that doesn't mean that they don't have financial resources available to them and can and will commit to hiring an attorney. Um, and oftentimes that's when I may refer them out to a younger attorney, um, maybe with less experience, but still a capable attorney um, that might be able to meet um, their price point that they're looking to hire an attorney at. Um, so by intending those uh, continuing legal education courses, again, you get to interact with lawyers, you get to ask them questions, get information from them, um, but then they also can turn into a referral source um, for you. Um, so whatever the minimum requirements are in your jurisdiction, you should look to exceed that. Go to as many as you can. Um, a lot of times, and um, at least in my area, for young lawyers, um, the um, registration fees are either waived or they're reduced in order to encourage your participation. So take full advantage of that. Thank you for your, thank you, Brother Jenkins. We have a question from our uh, advisor, uh, Ms. Tiffany Ag. Yes. Attorney Jenkins, thank you so much for your time. And I had a uh, similar start and started practicing immediately out of law school. But I okay. often tell my students that uh, mentoring and showing up were the two things that, the things that were my thing. I really yes. organized as you should be. Um, yes. Here a, a story that you can recall or share with them about why showing up, which may not sound like a lot, but if you're not present in certain places, you can't get that client. Is there something you can recall that was like a moment where you showed up that it was the trigger for something or you got a case or you saw why your presence shifted um, kind of your purpose and the direction of your career? Absolutely. I, I'll take you back to the very beginning. Um, when I first decided I wanted to embark on this road, um, and I had 
admit, I've been admitted to the Virginia State Bar, um, but I was a judicial law clerk at that time in the District of Columbia in our local courthouse, the, D, the District of Columbia Superior Court. Um, and I knew I wanted to practice in Virginia, but I had never uh, been out to Virginia, had never seen the inside of Virginia uh, courtroom or anything of that nature. And, but I started to ask and talk around about how I would go about starting. And one of the first pieces of advice I got um, from the individual I was clerking with was just go out to the courthouse, just go there um, and observe. Um, sit in, the, in a courtroom, see what's going on and start getting familiar with how practicing law would be in Virginia. I went to the court, um, met an individual who would later become my first law pro, um, pro, um, partner, uh, another African-American male attorney who just happened to be in the courthouse that day. Um, we met. Uh, he agreed to sponsor my admission. This was at a federal court to sponsor my admission uh, to that courthouse um, within days. Um, he had already offered to uh, rent me some office space on an ad need uh, basis, uh, which was great, uh, making it very, very affordable. Uh, he became my first um, mentor in the legal profession, um, helping to guide my steps. Uh, he referred my first case to me, um, was instrumental uh, to getting me not only admitted to that federal bar, but also having me included on the local Criminal Justice Act um, attorney listing, um, which became my original source of clients. Um, and it was through that um, that I really got my, the base of my clients um, really came from that. And that was all attributed to me just showing up to the courthouse um, on that particular date and time, um, which I just had the good fortune to meet him, uh, who went on to become even now one of my closest friends. Uh, he later became a groomsman in my wedding. Uh, his daughter was a uh, flower girl at my wedding. Um, and we've enjoyed a great long lasting relationship ever since. And it all started by me, as you said, just showing up. Thank you for that. That actually like manifested itself in, in, in unexpected ways that answer yeah. did. I appreciate that. Um, and do you mind if I piggyback off this, Mr. Stubbs, may I piggyback off something he said and ask a follow-up question? Some of them are my students, so they knew that this would likely happen anyway because yes. I'm kind of a professor. <laughs> um, but could you touch on, you mentioned that he sponsored you in a, um, another court. So could you kind of flesh that out a little bit because we have yes. a wide variety of students, what that means and the value yes. of relationships with other attorneys for that purpose. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> once you have successfully uh, negotiated whatever state bar you choose to take, um, that gets you admitted to that state bar. Um, but if you wish to practice in federal court, which was always my intent, um, you actually have to have your admission moved um, to be able to practice before that court. Um, and in order to do that, you'll need a sponsor. Uh, most uh, federal district courts require two sponsors um, to attest to your character and your fitness uh, to be admitted. There are also additional criteria, like you have to be admitted to the highest uh, court in that particular state in, all, in order to qualify also. Um, so that's what I mean by um, being sponsored for admission um, before that particular federal court, uh, which was the first federal uh, court I was admitted to. Um, once you're admitted to one, um, it's much easier to be admitted to others. Um, as Brother Stubbs indicated, I'm now admitted, um, I believe I'm up to now six or seven uh, different federal um, districts, as well as a uh, federal circuit. Um, one day I hope to be admitted to the United States Supreme Court. I qualify now, I just haven't gone through the process of actually making an application, but I hope to do so um, rather shortly. Um, but that's very key um, because um, I think it's important uh, to you being able to recruit clients for you to be able to um, be admitted to as many um, bars as you possibly can, um, state as well as federal. Um, because when someone comes calling upon you, you don't want to have to turn them away 
um, because you're not licensed to practice before that particular court. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Jenkins. You guys, we have, uh, we, this is your time to ask, uh, to ask all of the questions. Very rarely do you get a, you have a speaker that'll open the floodgate and let you ask whatever you want to ask. Uh, so now is the time to ask. Uh, I do believe we have um, two questions waiting here. Uh, one from uh, Latricia Davis. Would you go ahead and unmute yourself, Ms. Davis? Yes. Hello, Attorney Jenkins. Hi. Hi, thank you for being here with us on today. Um, so we've heard all about your career, your legal career. I wanted to know what challenges, if any, did you face as a new attorney starting your own law firm? Yes, um, well, there were many, many challenges. I, I, I remember one of the um, scariest moments I ever had when I first started. Um, things moved pretty quick for me moved pretty quick for me. Um, I graduated in May of 1995, um, sat for the bar in July uh, of that year, um, was admitted in October, uh, was one of the lucky ones and I passed on my first time out, uh, which was a scary thing because I wasn't looking forward to taking the bar a second time. Um, but in any event, um, once I got admitted in October, um, I got admitted to my first federal district court in November. And as I indicated, I immediately um, was added to the Criminal Justice Act list of attorneys to represent individ uh, indigent individuals. And I got my first assignment later on that month in November uh, and found myself in my first jury trial in federal court in March of the following year. Um, it was a terrifying moment uh, for me. One of the most challenging moments that I had, um, that I've had throughout my entire career. And I've done some pretty, um, you know, incredible things in terms of representation. I've represented individuals charged with death penalty um, um, cases. Um, I've even um, represented clients right on up through execution. Um, and those were challenging and those were scary moments, but, um, still, that first jury trial, um, less than one year out of graduating, um, with only about um, five months of practice experience, um, I found myself in, in federal court facing 12 citizens, um, a jury, um, with an individual's freedom um, dependent on my representation. And it was a challenging and a scary moment. And I still remember to this day, and in our local uh, courthouse, uh, many who've known me since the beginning of my career, um, they still tease me about this. Um, when I stood up to make my opening in that case, um, I just confessed to the jury that uh, this was the first time I'd ever done this. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to do. Um, I told the jury I was gonna make mistakes. Um, but I was going to try real hard, um, said the judge is probably going to have to correct me and the prosecutor is going to probably point out every mistake I make. <laughs> uh, but please understand um, that this is my first time uh, and I'm going to do the best I can and work really hard. And most importantly, don't hold it against my client. It's not his fault. <laughs> uh, so that was probably the biggest uh, challenge that I first encountered. Uh, but there were others just in running a business. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what it is. Um, you're practicing law, you're in the service industry, um, but never lose sight of the fact that you're running a business. Um, you have to make ends meet. Uh, there has to be revenue coming in. Um, you're gonna have expenses. You're gonna have to learn to manage those expenses. Um, and I always tell young warriors that you wear two hats. Um, one, you're a lawyer, all right? But number two, you're a business person. And if someone were to ask me, well, between those two, how would you proportion it out? What is the most significant? How would you allocate your resources? I would tell you, and maybe this will be a, a surprise to you, it's more important in the beginning to be a better business person than a lawyer. Okay, um, many individuals who fail at 
trying to run their own practice, they don't fail because they don't know how to practice law. Um, that's not it. They don't fail because they're not bright. Uh, they don't have a good legal mind. More often than not, they fail because they're not good business people um, and they don't make good business decisions. Um, so that's very, very, very important. And it's a challenge that you're going to always have to confront whether you're a lawyer with one year of experience or like myself, closer to 30 years of experience, it's still something that you're confronted with. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we do have a question here from um, Ms. Lee. Will you go ahead and unmute yourself, Ladera? Hello, um, I do have one question for you. What do you wish that you would have known about the legal profession before you started? Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll go a, a step back and then I'll get to the actual practice of law. Um, I'll tell you, I really love being a lawyer and I aspired to be a lawyer ever since I was in grade school. I mean, I don't think um, I ever wanted to do anything else in life. Um, and I'm talking about going back to second, third grade. Uh, when it was dress up for professional day, I had a three piece suit on in the seventies and carrying a briefcase uh, because I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, when I got to law school, um, one of the most disappointing things for me was that it did not meet my expectations on what I thought um, law school was going to be. In fact, um, you know, I'm not embarrassed to say I really hated law school. Uh, there wasn't much about it I liked at all. Um, and it was really because, um, one, first, it was a huge cultural challenge for me. Um, I grew up in the South. I'm originally from Charleston, South Carolina. And again, I'm going to date myself. I grew up at a time in which schools, particularly public schools in the South, still were, uh, for the most part, segregated. Um, and so I went to all Black schools um, throughout elementary school, middle school, and high school. Um, and then I chose to go to Howard University in Washington, D.C., uh, another all Black school. And I chose Howard University um, because my prior educational experience, um, I, you know, all of my teachers um, went to Spelman, Morehouse, North Carolina a and South Carolina State. Um, so HBCUs were, I mean, just a natural choice for me. Um, those were the people who had shaped and guided me up until that point. The first time I found myself where I was a minority in an academic setting, um, was in law school. Um, I went to George Washington University, also in Washington, D.C. And now I was um, 10 African-American students uh, in a section, a uh, law school section of 125, okay? Um, each one of my classes in first year, there were 125 students and only 10 of us were African-American. That was a huge culture shock for me. Never been in a situation like that. Secondly, um, I thought law school was gonna be more like a trade school. Um, I thought while in law school, I was gonna learn how to write a contract. I was gonna learn how to draft a will. Um, I was gonna learn how to um, actually try a case. And for those of you who are in law school, you know that's not really what happens. Um, you spend a lot of time reading cases, um, briefing cases, studying cases, um, and the like, but you don't spend a great deal of time actually doing the nuts and bolts that you're going to be expected to do when you get out of law school. Um, so law school didn't quite meet my expectation. I wish I knew that beforehand because I still would have went to law school, but it would have changed my expectation. And maybe I wouldn't have um, you know, disliked it as much. Once I started practicing, um, you know, I wish again, going back to what I said, um, that I had a better understanding of the import of being a good business person and learning how to manage my business affairs. Um, in undergrad, I was a history major, uh, did not 
have a business background at all. Um, I wish I had had um, um, if I had to do it all over again, um, I would have focused more attention on business courses while I was in undergrad um, because I can really, really see the value of that. Um, again, because it's very important to being successful if you're going to run your own practice. Um, so I wish I had that experience before I stepped out there. Um, actually, in practicing law, um, I wish I had a greater appreciation for just how important the interpersonal relationships are in developing them and leveraging them. Um, so much of the practice law of law is about relationships. Um, if you're in the civil arena, um, dealing with opposing counsel and having good relationships with um, the attorneys that are going to be that you're going to have to deal with on a daily basis. It's not like on TV. Um, oftentimes on TV, lawyers are portrayed as being adversarial and confrontational all the time. And that's just not true. Um, um, for the most part, it's a cooperative type relationship. Um, you have your respective interests and your advocates for your particular side, uh, but it's about relationships. Um, certain prosecutors may be willing to do certain things for me that they may not be willing to do for someone that they don't have uh, the same relationship with. And the same goes for your relationships with the, with the bench. Um, how you are perceived in the uh, relationships you have with the judges in your local jurisdiction is key and very important. Um, and that's something I didn't fully appreciate also, uh, because before I started practicing law, I thought lawyers and judges, um, that it was a standoff relationship, that they um, type of situation and they didn't really interact with each other. And that's just not true. Um, judges are members of the bar also. Um, in Virginia, they're required to take CLE courses also. Um, and you get a chance to interact with them. And many of them are hungry for just that. Um, they enjoy interacting with lawyers. And um, I didn't really appreciate that when I first started. Um, so that's something that I wish I knew beforehand because I would have started developing those relationships earlier and therefore be in a position to leverage them sooner. So those are just some of the things. Thank you. Yes. Brother Jenkins, I want to just piggyback on two things that you said. The first yes. thing um, being uh, with law school, I uh, when I when I started my law school uh, matriculation, I the same way. I thought that you know, and my contracts professor is on the line as well, so <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, use what, use his class as an example. I thought that I would learn how to effectively write contracts. Try, and to yeah. this day, uh, I mean, I of course we know I've learned the various cl clauses within a contract and how you know the verbiage and what does this mean. But I don't believe I've ever written per se, an That's actual right. contract. So it was yeah. it was just mind blowing to me. You, I mean, I know the concepts of what a contract consists of That's and right. all of these things, but I've never, I've never actually physically written out a complete contract from start to finish. So it's, it's ironic. I guess that's the experience across the board, but I've yeah. never done that. And, and the second thing being the three piece suits, I'm gonna make a joke here. You, I mean, you were, you were new back in the, th in the third grade. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they say. That's what they say. Uh, you know what? I I'll tell you this. I'll share this with you also about me. It's one of the reasons why I was attracted to the profession. Um, I've always been comfortable wearing a suit. I wasn't that kid going to Sunday school, you know, can't wait to get out of the tie and whatnot. I looked forward to Easter because I got a new suit. <laughs> I got to dress up in a suit. So that's one of the things that certainly early on let me know that this was the profession for me. Um, going back to what you said about the contract, um, very early on talking about leveraging those relationships. Um, and when I transitioned from um, law school, um, one of those uh, relationships that I leveraged, and it continues to um, be a source of clients and uh, mentorship and support for me, is our fraternity, is Cap Alpha Psi. Um, I, you know, and today marks my 29th uh, anniversary as a member of Cap Alpha Psi, uh, and I've been an active financial member of 
Cap Alpha Psi since March the 20th, 1992. Um, and upon my graduation from law school, I immediately affiliated with my local alumni chapter, which I've been a member of ever since, the Washington DC alumni chapter. And one of my very first clients uh, came from um, that chapter uh, who came to me and said, uh, Brother Jenkins, can you prepare a will for me? A will. I think it'll be pretty simple. I don't have a whole lot of assets and, and whatnot. And of course I said, yes, not ever having even attempted to draft a will. Now, yes, I had successfully negotiated wills, trust in the states in law school, uh, part one and part two in my law school and did pretty well in the class, but had never attempted to draft a will. Um, so that was one of those real world challenges that I was confronted with um, because I had someone who was prepared to hire me, um, wanted me to do something that he thought would be pretty simple. Um, but I had to go to the law library and spend hours on looking up how to draft a will, uh, getting practice manuals and samples and things of that nature. Now for something that I couldn't really charge for all the time, and effort that it took me uh, to be able to draft this will, but it was an investment uh, because that was an experience that I, once I did it the first time, um, it would be that much easier the next time. Uh, the next person came and said, look, I need a will done. Um, and so that's, that's, that's very key to the success. Um, and every organization that I'm a part of, um, I've drawn clients from. Um, um, from my church, um, the same has been the case. Um, when I was in law school, I did have the good fortune to be inducted into a legal fraternity um, that had older members um, that were practicing in the Washington DC area. Uh, and again, they became a source of clients for me also, as well as serving as mentors to me. Um, so that's very key, very important. So I, I, I definitely, I definitely, I totally agree with what you're saying. And it's, it's ironic that um, you mentioned about, I, we, they, out of Miss A, Tiffany Ag, Miss, our professor, uh, Tiffany Ag and uh, Julian Hendricks, uh, both of, Professor Julian Hendricks are both on the line with us. And they both tell us all the time that there are going to be times where you can't necessarily bill for those hours. Uh, that's right. <laughs> that's where you're going to have to do your actual, especially coming out the gate, yeah. you're going to have to research. Um, yeah. Ms. Ag teaches uh, legal research and writing, and she emphasizes that with us. There are going to be times out the gate that you're going to have to research, and you can't charge for those hours, but you're going to have to research to be effective at what it is that you're doing. No doubt about it. I, I, I remember back Again, I'll, I'll state it again, because I think it's worth saying, things started really, really, really fast for me. A lot of things kind of just fell um, um, in my direction. Um, call it divine intervention, good luck, um, whatever. Um, it just happened for me. After that first federal trial in March of 1996, um, it was about three months thereafter, I got a call um, from that judge his law clerk, um, indicating that the judge wanted to appoint me to a matter. Um, and it was a matter in which a young man who was already in prison um, in a maximum security um, prison had been accused of killing a fellow inmate um, and that he was charged with a capital offense, uh, meaning that if convicted, he could potentially face um, execution and the judge wanted to appoint me as lead counsel um, because he was impressed with my performance in my very first jury trial that happened to be in front of him. Um, that was a scary moment um, because at this point in time, I hadn't even been out of law school a year and I really couldn't believe that this was happening. Um, when I told the law clerk that I would be um, excited and delighted to accept such an appointment. I thought it was a real honor um, that the judge would turn to me because um, most, for the most part, judges usually seek out the best available attorneys for capital uh, punishment cases, particularly in federal court. 
Um, so I just couldn't believe that this opportunity was falling in my lap. Um, and it was also an opportunity to earn a fee well beyond anything that I had earned up until that point. Um, but when I told the law clerk, yes, the law clerk, I still remember to this day, said, well, um, prior to making the appointment, the judge has to, you know, assure himself that you are qualified. So let me ask you a few questions. I said, okay, fine. Um, and he said, well, when did you graduate? And I said, May. He said, okay, but May of what year? I said, last May. <laughs> he said, what? I said, yes, I graduated last May. This was like in April of the following year. Um, and he said, well, hold on, because I don't think the judge understands that. So he put me on hold. And the next voice I heard was this federal judge. Um, and he said, Mr. Jenkins, do I have this correct? You just graduated from law school last May. I said, yes. Said, I he said, well, when were you admitted to the bar? I said, October. He said, like six months ago? I said, yeah, like six months ago. He said, well, Mr. Jenkins, first, let me say your performance um, in front of me was just outstanding. Um, and I never would have known. Um, unfortunately, um, he said, um, you have to have at least five years of practice um, in order to um, be appointed as lead counsel in this case. Um, and I just thought based on your performance that you were well beyond that point. Um, I took that as a compliment. But what he said was, um, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do um, something a little extraordinary, something out of the box, um, because I think you have talent and I think you are gonna be an asset to this court well into the future. I'm gonna appoint two other attorneys um, um, to serve on this matter, but I'm still gonna appoint you as the third attorney. Uh, you're gonna be compensated at the same rate as um, lead counsel, um, but I'm gonna give you this opportunity to learn. Um, to follow these attorneys around um, and to learn um, this area of practice um, so that you can get up to speed. Now, the amount of hours I put into that case and trying to learn what I was supposed to be doing in a death penalty case, there's no way I could build the court for all that time um, at, uh, at, at all. But again, it was an investment and turned out to be an extraordinarily professionally rewarding experience. I got to look inside of capital punishment. Um, I've gone since that time, um, I've represented individuals charged with capital punishment my entire career. Um, in fact, I represent a young man right now uh, who is facing a capital, uh, two capital murder charges in federal court um, even right now. Uh, and as I said, I've run the full gamut. I've seen the ups and the down, the success, successes of uh, preventing someone from facing um, um, execution um, to actually being in the death chamber uh, when executions have been carried out. Um, and it certainly is something that um, has been very impactful, um, not just as my experience as an attorney, um, but just as a human being, um, because uh, as many, would say, uh, in my view, this is certainly true in criminal defense, there is no higher calling uh, than to be charged with the responsibility of representing someone whose life is literally in your hands, um, whose life is literally depending on your performance uh, in that courtroom. Um, there is no higher calling. Yes, sir. Thank you, um, Brother Jenkins. Uh, we have a question from uh, Ms. Tiffany Agee, well, Professor Tiffany Agee. Attorney Jenkins, I am glad you said that. I love being able to quote and cite people when I see my students uh, in follow-up weeks. Um, my second appointed case after I was out for a year and a half was a capital murder appeal in state court. And I actually <laughs> won't say no, because it frightened me. Um, because I just never done anything. All I knew was somebody's yes. life was and yeah. If you don't uh, argue everything, you waive um, their arguments on direct, and that was direct appeal. And That's so right. it was very stressful. So I can appreciate that level of stress. And I know I spent over 200 hours in that case. Yeah. Um, he was under, under 19, he had a low IQ. There was, there was a lot going on, yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. But I can appreciate that the working independently, I think those intangibles you pointed out are across the board. 
right? Yeah. That's how, that's what drives that. My question for you is admittedly, because I was so involved in that, running a business was secondary, if I'm mm-hmm. honest to me, because all I could think of was, he, yeah, I had to do something. Yeah. Um, and it was on appeal, so he was already convicted. And so I was, I felt like I was in a hole. Are there one methods that you can think of to try to help balance that out um, or, or pitfalls maybe to avoid? And secondly, are there specific things you can think of? For example, I remember the argument, did I get an office or just a PO box or both? Like things like that, specific things and actually yeah. building um, an infrastructure for your business while you deal with you know, being at least inexperienced and having to put in that extra time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you have to keep your eye on the prize. And like I said, you're running a business and that's very important. And the challenge sometimes that, or the conflict that that sometimes will create um, for a young inexperienced warrior is that you want the experience, right? Um, so that makes the case or the potential client an attraction because you need the experience. Uh, but at the same time, you got bills to pay. Um, so you can only comp- afford to compromise your fee or the terms in which you would take the case, but so much. You can only do that because you've got to um, you know, keep the lights on. At the same time, you can't really afford to allow potential clients to walk away uh, without you being able to uh, capitalize on that potential fee. Uh, my philosophy, my first few years out, was that no one who came to my office to consult with me was going to leave without hiring me. Just was not going to happen. Um, If that meant I had to compromise uh, my original asking fee, I was willing to do so. If that meant I had to be more flexible with how they could satisfy my fee, then I was going to do that. Uh, because I always felt as though that some fee was better than no fee. Um, so I had to um, do that just as a business person. Um, so you just have to uh, keep that in mind. In terms of some of those tangible things that you have to do, um, the landscape has shifted a little bit from when I started, um, even more so just in the last year or so with COVID. Um, and being able to take advantage of platforms like this. Needless to say, this was not available um, 30 years ago. Um, This was not an option for me to meet with a client uh, through some means like this. Um, Accepting payments from clients, you couldn't do that online because that wasn't a possibility and things. So everything was very hands-on and therefore it heightened the need to have a physical location where you could meet. Um, nowadays, if I was starting out, I don't know if I would necessarily have a physical location. Um, I might, um, you know, do everything virtual um, to drive down my costs um, and also to be a more convenience to the potential client. Um, the client doesn't have to take time to drive to your office and make that investment on their part. If you could simply uh, meet them by way of FaceTime or Zoom. Um, In today's market, I can see how that could be very attractive to um, to, to a lot of clients. Um, Having a address that is going to be something that you can maintain um, for a long-term period is very, very, very important. Um, Because clients, once you start having business cards and you start publishing a address, um, you don't want to be in a situation where every two or three years, that's changing. That makes it more difficult for uh, future clients, repeat clients to find you. And a large part of your business is going to come from repeat clients, if you're doing good work, if you're delivering good service. Uh, Clients will continue to come back to you and they will continue to refer clients to you well after their engagement with you has ceased. Um, And sometimes, even to this day, I have clients who just, potential clients who just knock on the door. They just show up um, because someone has given them the address. I still have the same mobile number um, that I originally got when cell phones first started, (laughs) okay? 
Um, I had one of those big, large phones that your, your students probably have only seen in movies from the late 80s and whatnot. But I had one of those and my phone number is still the same, still the same. Um, and I started as one of those things to make myself kind of unique to the marketplace. Um, when cell phones first came out, um, it wasn't, the billing wasn't the way it is now. You actually had to pay by the minute, okay? Every call you made, you got billed for. So as a consequence, most lawyers who had cell phones, they didn't give out their cell phones to potential clients uh, or even clients. It usually was something that uh, was guarded um, and was given out very rarely because people didn't want to incur the expenses of clients calling them or the inconvenience of clients calling them you know, throughout the day, throughout the night, early mornings, on the weekends and things of that nature. I made, it, I made a business decision very early on um, that I would provide my cell number to any potential client, to all of my clients, um, so that they could have direct access to me 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day. Um, and I did that because I knew that would set me apart. Now, I knew that there would be a associated cost with doing that, um, but I thought that that would be offset um, by the fact that it would make me more attractive um, to my clients. Uh, when I gave them my card, it had my cell number on it, not the office number. Um, and I said, here, you can use this 24 hours a day. Um, call me whenever you need to, and we'll, we'll deal with the problem. Now, that was real good if it was a hourly rate case, uh, because I could bill for that time. Uh, but even for uh, cases that I had, that I had negotiated flat fees, uh, where I wasn't getting paid per call, if you will, uh, per hour, um, it still made me more attractive uh, to potential clients. So that's something that I did. Um, so having a phone number um, that you can use um, for an extended period of time is very good. Um, I tell young lawyers who might choose to associate with a small firm when they first get out with their goal to build their own independent practice later on, I still tell them, get your own telephone number, a number that you're going to be able to take with you when you leave that practice and start your own practice. Um, because if not, um, your client who um, might in the future be looking for you uh, will call the old number of that old firm, and now you'll be dependent on that firm doing the right thing by sending that person, forwarding that person on to your new number. And you don't want to be a hostage to that. You don't want to have to rely on that. Um, so as early as you can, develop your own identity uh, with phone numbers and a physical address um, that you hopefully will be able to maintain for your entire career. Uh, in 26 years, I've moved my physical location three times um, um, because I was forced to. Um, the current location, we've been there now for more than 20 years, more than 20 years. And that serves me very well. And as I said, I've had the same cell number uh, for my entire career. And that served me very well. Thank you uh, so much for the kind of full encompassing answer. And, you know, one of my last things is I've heard, I've heard people who work in bigger firms say that you don't do special things as a solo or people don't respect solo practitioners. I, of course, don't think that because I think it's an honorable yes. profession. Um, yeah. It's an honor to defend and represent the people that we do. You know, it's yeah. an honor to serve. Take, we take an oath anyway. So at that part, we're, we're already set apart. So yes. um, I don't think that, but sometimes you can be treated like that. So is there one bit of advice, because I think you actually answered like what set you apart in a world of much bigger mm -hmm. firms, with deeper yeah. pockets, frankly, you know, longer resources and longer experience. Many of us didn't know lawyers growing up and we start fresh out of the gate um, without yeah. those kind of networks. So what is it that you can identify like one thing, one, one thing you told yourself to get yourself over those times where you may not have thought that you were enough or you could do it and the thing that set you apart. Now, if you already answered that letter part, it sounds like you did, you know, that's yeah. fine. Same thing else in addition, you could think that sets you apart from these bigger firms that take up, you know, a large market share. 
a larger market share in the space that you're trying to navigate? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know, and, and this was something that you just have to be mindful of no matter what path you choose, whether or not you want to open your own practice or even go in a big firm. Nothing beats hard work. You've got to be committed to being prepared to outwork the competition. You have to be prepared to do that, to outwork the competition. One of the um, first most significant white collar crime cases um, that I got, um, again, maybe within my first year of practice, um, was a very wealthy individual um, who had grown dissatisfied. He had a, um, a significant tax case. He had grown dissatisfied with this major downtown Washington, D.C., 400 lawyer law firm who had been handling his matter beforehand. And his chief complaint about them was that he felt they were not giving him personal time and attention, that they treated him just like every other client, um, that he wanted a lawyer who was committed to him, who he felt had a personal stake in the outcome of his matter, who would devote um, personal time and attention to him. And when you're a young lawyer, and again, as I said, your number one commodity that you have is time. Uh, and you have more of it than someone else who is, um, who may have a client docket of 20, 30 clients. That's, that's not your challenge. That's not your reality in the beginning. Um, and I gave him, I represented that to him. And he also identified this about me because he told me this at the time he chose to hire me. He said, I can sense your hunger. And because of that, I know you're going to do a good job. You want this case more than the big firm. You understand um, how impactful it could be for you if you do a good job in this case. Over there downtown, I'm just one. I'm a dime a dozen. They have many clients like me. Um, the fees that I'm paying them is not special. For me, it was special. He was absolutely correct. Up until that point, um, I'll share this with you too. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't come from a well-heeled family. I, I came, I'm first generation um, to go to um, college, let alone law school. Uh, when I graduated from law school, um, like many um, graduates, I was overburdened with debt. Um, I had horrible credit um, based on poor decisions I made when I was in law school. Uh, when I was in undergrad, um, I wasn't in a position um, to, you know, get a credit card or to lease or rent anything. Everything I got, all my office equipment, everything I had to pay um, cash. Um, as money came in, I went and bought my first computer. When I first started, I didn't have a computer. Um, I went to Howard University's Law Library and I used the computers there. Um, and I, saw, I didn't have a car. I took public transportation to courthouses around Northern Virginia. Sometimes that meant I had to get up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning uh, to take a train and two buses to get to the courthouse. I still remember my first year uh, getting on the bus on my way to court and sitting across from me was my client who was on the way to court. <laughs> and he really got a kick out of the fact that his lawyer was taking public transportation with him. But this one case, this, 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 that, that first tax case um, was so financially rewarding. Um, I was able to solve that transportation problem, um, bought a car, uh, a nice car, a brand new Mercedes, <laughs> um, my first car, not the wisest, financial decision because I still was living in an apartment, but I had a brand new Mercedes Benz sitting out in the parking lot uh, as a reward uh, to myself. But it was um, that client identified in me my hunger um, um, to do a good job um, because he was right. Um, unlike that big firm, he was special to me. He was my most special client. Um, and he called me day and night and I answered. Um, anything he needed me to do, any place he needed me to be, I was there. Um, and the previous law firm just didn't give him that type of treatment. Never forget, 
at the end of the day, you're in the customer service industry. That's what it is. Client satisfaction should always be your goal. Client satisfaction. That will pay back in dividends throughout the years. Um, they will go on. They will spread the word for you. There are all kinds of marketing tools out there. But still, in the legal profession, nothing is more valuable than word of mouth referrals. From other clients who have been satisfied with your services and other lawyers who have previously referred clients to you who have heard good things about you. Those will always be your best sources of clients, not the internet, not your web page, not a fancy commercial. Your best referrals will always come from former clients and other members of the bar. Thank you, Brother Jenkins. We have another question here from Sheena Clayton. Sheena, will you go ahead and unmute yourself? Hello, Attorney Jenkins. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. You have given us so much knowledge um, and our professors I know are doing a great job because we've heard a lot of it, but to hear it, to hear you come back and, and piggyback and say it again, it just makes it so real. Um, put people first, um, do the right thing, those type of things. Yeah. It's, just, it's just good to hear. My question for you was, um, your moment, your big aha moment. I know you said you came out of law school, you passed the bar, you went right into it. What was your moment? You, you told us about some different things that you've encountered, some different um, cases that you came to. Um, when you actually walked in a courtroom and said, I got this, you felt good about it. You went back to your office and said, I have arrived. What was that moment? How did it feel? And how did you know that you had arrived? Well, I, you know, certainly, um, I don't know if I can distill it down to one moment. Um, I, can, I, I think there were a series of things. I'll go back to that first jury trial, uh, my very first jury trial. Um, my client was convicted. And after that client was convicted and sentenced to uh, do some time, um, I can't put in words how horrible I felt. Um, because, you know, I felt so responsible. Um, I had not committed the conduct that led him to being charged um, and ultimately convicted. Um, but I felt so, so, so bad. I felt like I had let him down. Um, I felt like I had let myself down uh, because, you know, I wanted to win. Um, because let me tell you, um, especially if you want to be a trial lawyer, um, you've got to have a strong competitive drive um, that you want to win um, throughout, you know, up until becoming a lawyer. Um, I was a college athlete, um, heavily into athletics. Um, so I have a pretty strong competitive drive. Um, but after that experience, I remember telling myself, I don't like this and I don't want to experience this much at all. And I'm gonna do everything I can. And if that means I have to double my efforts the next time, um, have to spend more time with the case, um, work a little bit harder, I'm gonna do that because this is a feeling that I just don't like and I don't want to experience. Now, being a criminal defense attorney, it's gonna happen uh, because the truth of the matter is the vast majority of your clients are gonna be individuals who ultimately are going to be convicted. Uh, because the truth of the matter is, for the most part, law enforcement don't randomly run out and grab innocent people to arrest. It happens sometimes, but for the most part, that's not the reality uh, of the world that we live in. And for the most part, prosecutors don't go out of their way to charge and convict innocent people. For the most part, they charge and seek to convict individuals who are responsible for the criminal act. Um, and so if you're gonna make a career as a criminal defense attorney, you have to understand that for the most part, most of the individuals you represent ultimately are going to be convicted. But that was a moment that caused me to redouble my efforts um, because I felt so responsible uh, and I wanted to work hard. 
Um, my next jury trial after that was in state court uh, and my client was acquitted. Um, and that was a moment, um, if I ever had to distill it down to one where I said, I got this, I certainly can do this. Um, it was standing next to that client and hearing the clerk read nine times, not guilty. Um, that was truly an awesome, awesome feeling. Um, it was a felony matter um, involving um, some charges of theft, um, and that was a great moment. Um, inside of three years, um, I experienced something that still might be, if not the highest point, one of the highest points of my legal career. Um, I represented an individual charged with capital murder in federal court. Um, five counts of capital murder, um, and he was found not guilty. And to put that in perspective, at that time, since um, the reactivation of the federal death penalty in 1977, um, at, up until that point, and I think that occurred around 2000, there had only been 12 acquittals of individuals charged with capital murder in federal court. 12 in nearly 30 years. Um, and for me as a young lawyer, uh, with only about three, four years of practice, um, to be a part of that um, was another moment that just reaffirmed in my mind that I was doing the right thing and I was in the right place. I've always felt as though that um, I am doing what God intended me to do, um, that I was born to be a trial lawyer. Um, as I said, whether it was even before I knew what a lawyer was, um, my, you know, love for dressing in a suit and a tie and doing that, um, my um, comfort level um, with speaking in front of people. Um, I never was one of those individuals that was shy about that, um, that, um, you know, was afraid of public speaking. Um, there's just certain things about me that fit very well with being a trial lawyer. Um, so I've always felt as though that I found um, my calling, if you will. Um, this is what I was born to do. Thank you. Yes. All right, so we'll do one last call for any more questions. Do we have any additional questions out there? If you if you have any questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Well then I guess okay. I guess that's all of our questions. Again, great. Thank you so much, Brother Jenkins. I we I, I greatly appreciate it. You were, as I stated, he, I reached out to him um, via social media. I mean, he was beyond, um, like, I mean, he responded like that and, and yes. graciously accepted the engagement. And I, I greatly appreciate it. And we greatly appreciate it at Miles Law School and the Black Law Students, Black Law Students Association. Also, I will be reaching out to you um, to, to uh, obtain an, a mailing address for you. We will be sending you a um, token of appreciation uh, in the mail to you. Um, at this point in time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Madam President Ladera Lee, and we'll have closer remarks from her and uh, closer remarks from my advisor, uh, Ms. Tiffany Ag. I thank you again, everyone, for joining us uh, this afternoon on this Saturday before spring break or i.e. read week. But uh, thank you for taking the time out to join us. We do appreciate it. A special thank you to Attorney Jenkins. Just thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and sharing those challenges that you face starting out with your own firm. So we look forward to seeing everyone at our next guest lecture series event, which will be in April. And that will be all. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. Attorney Jenkins, I'm just going to um, share the same sentiments as Ms. Lee. I, um, I appreciate how candid you are. And I think that's one of the things that we um, 
I think that's sometimes missing in these types of conversations. Like, what does it look like to quote practice law and how can you be successful? Um, and it does ebb and flow, but I think that you gave us uh, a great framework and structure to put everything in. Like, what does it look like? And all of this, again, was driven by your intangibles, again, which are applicable across the board when it comes to running your business and it, when it comes to being a good attorney, both of which have to be done simultaneously. And so I appreciate how you told us um, one, that you, you clearly had some direction, um, but that didn't mean that you knew what everything looked like when you got there, but you made the necessary adjustments, which I think that a, a good lawyer knows how to adjust um, on the fly and I, because everything cha is constantly changing. That's the one thing that's difficult about being a lawyer. It just, it always changes and you have to move with it and still have successful outcomes for your client because your client, you know, your client doesn't care. Like your job is, is one thing and it's solution driven. Um, and so I appreciate that you, you know, kept a consistent theme with us and thank you so much for your time um, on this Saturday. And I was about to say, you know, uh, thank you for wearing a suit today, but it sounds like you like wearing suits anyway, because <laughs> um, it is Saturday. And I was like, wow, we are, we're both you and Mr. Stubbs, <laughs> ironically enough, both suited at this point, probably not ironic since you uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but again, thank you very much. And, and you know, it was an enjoyable um, hour and a half and it frankly didn't feel like that. If I could speak on behalf of everyone, it was a great um, conversation and it, it felt very, um, you know, relatable. So I do thank you for that time. Well, thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Well, thank, again, uh, I, if, if all hearts and minds are on the one accord, <laughs> again, thank you so much, um, Brother Jenkins. Uh, we greatly appreciate you uh, for taking the time out to speak with us. And if there's nothing else, I'll go ahead and I'll stop the meeting. All right. Take care, guys. Bye.